Hey guys, I'm back today to read chapter 16, uh, Gathering Evidence, and we are getting very close to the end, and I'm really excited to see what happens. Um, so when we left off yesterday, um, Tyrell had just captured uh, the criminals, and they are in jail. At 8.30 the next morning, Tyrell was back at Central Station with a new pair of shoes in his hand. He walked through the station to the jail cells and handed the shoes through the bars to Jack Hughes. He told Hughes to put on this pair and hand out the ones he was wearing. Hughes' shoes were needed as evidence. Hughes asked, evidence of what? Tyrell explained that he and Mullen were being charged with attempting to rob the Lincoln's, or attempting to rob Lincoln's tomb. The shoes placed Hughes in Springfield on the night of the crime. One of Tyrell's private eyes <clears throat> and the shoe, er, oh. One of Tyrell's private eyes had seen Hughes going into a shoemaker's shop, and the shoemaker could identify Hughes, as well as his own work on the man's shoes. Both Hughes and Mullen assured Tyrell they were innocent. But before saying more, they wanted a lawyer. Specifically, they wanted William O'Brien, one of Chicago's top criminal defense lawyers. O'Brien came to the prison later that day and met with his new clients in private. After the meeting, the lawyer announced his personal theory to the newspapers. Tyrell and Elmer Washburn had designed an elaborate put-up job. They'd framed Hughes and Mullen in order to make a high-profile arrest and get themselves some good press. O'Brien even invited a reporter from the Chicago Times to come down to the station to interview the poor victims, Hughes and Mullen. Tyrell had no objection. He was curious to hear the bogus story O'Brien and his clients had concocted. And concocted just means like came up with. The papers have implicated you in the attempted despoiling of Lincoln's tomb, the Times reporter said to Hughes and Mullen that night at the police station. Now, let me have your side of the story. I'll make a full statement, Hughes offered, and I'll commence with the time I met with I met this Swaggles. Tyrell sat and listened as Hughes spun his tail. Swaggles, the horse thief, as Hughes called the roper, had started hanging around the hub maybe a year before. He was always pitching ideas for crimes, Hughes explained, always bringing Hughes, oh, sorry, always bugging Hughes to come in on his latest scheme. For instance, he asked Hughes to help him pick up about $7,000 worth of stolen dry goods he'd stashed in an Indiana barn. Now remember, $7,000 back then was quite a bit more money than we think of today. Now, $7,000 is still a lot of money, but it was even more back then. I told him I wasn't that kind of man, Hughes assured the reporter, and I wouldn't go into the thing. At about that time, Hughes said, he started noticing Patrick Tyrell following him and started hearing rumors that the Secret Service was working a put-up job on him. Then, continued Hughes, right before the election, he and Mullen took a train to Springfield to visit Mullen's brother. Mullen had gotten a letter from a doctor saying his brother was very unwell. And there on the train was the incredibly annoying Swaggles, greeting them with a grin and a bottle of whiskey. We declined to take any as we didn't want to be bothered by the fellow. While Mullen looked for his brother, the horse thief tailed Hughes around Springfield, whispering something about a pile of money to be made in town. He then told me the whole particulars of the plan to rob Lincoln's grave of the body, Hughes explained. What did you say to that? asked the reporter. I was never so astonished in my life. I told him it was out of my line of business and I wouldn't have anything to do with it. And that's all there was to it, Hughes said. At six o'clock that evening, he and Mullen got back on the train. Unable to find Mullen's brother, they decided to visit Hughes' father at the farm. Then, ten days later in Chicago, they were arrested for no reason. In my opinion, added Hughes, the whole thing is a scheme to give Washburn and Tyrell a little notary. Hughes appeared cool and confident. Noted, sorry, Hughes appeared cool and confident, noted the reporter. Mullen was the opposite, shifting nervously in his chair, avoiding eye contact. The interview ended at 9.30. Tyrell chained Hughes and Mullen together and took them to the train station. The overnight train carried the prisoners back to Springfield to face charges in Lincoln's hometown. Tyrell must have been at least slightly concerned by Hughes' story. It was riddled with lies, but it sounded believable enough. It might even convince a jury. On Monday morning, residents of Springfield crowded into the city jail to see the prisoners. Everyone was curious. What would men wicked enough to steal Lincoln's corpse look like? Nearly all were disappointed. 
wrote one reporter. They looked like two ordinary guys. Hughes and Mullen were officially charged with two crimes, conspiracy to steal the remains of Abraham Lincoln and attempted larceny and trying to steal the casket, being the property of the Lincoln Monument Association. The combined charges carried a maximum sentence of up to five years in the state penitentiary. The judge set bail at $11,000 each, far more than Hughes and Mullen could raise. So they settled into prison to wait a while. Meanwhile, Tyrell gathered evidence. He talked to John Carroll Power at the Lincoln Monument. Power assured Tyrell he had seen Hughes at the monument the afternoon of the break-in and would testify to it in court. And to testify just means to tell like your side of things what you saw. He talked to the ticket agents at the Springfield train station. The suspects claimed to have left on the 6 p.m. train, but no tickets had been sold to men meeting their description. Then, Thomas Kegel strolled into town. When the farmer read an account of the crime in the newspaper, he'd immediately thought of the two dust-covered travelers who'd come up to him while he was loading potatoes the morning after the election. So, he came to take a look at the suspects and see if they were the same men. Guards led Kegel into the city jail, but didn't point out any particular prisoners. There were 18 small cells holding a total of 35 men. The farmer walked down the hall between the cells, looking at faces. He stopped in front of cell number 10. Hello, Kegel shouted to Hughes and Mullen. Have they got you fellows already? Mullen's face twisted into a bitter grin. Hughes sat straight-faced. Neither said a word. Conductor John Foggay of the Illinois Central Railroad also visited the jail. He identified Hughes and Mullen as the passengers who'd gotten on his train in Chestnut with a crazy story about buying cows and no money to pay their fare. This was all decent evidence. It exposed lies in the story Hughes and Mullen had told, but none of it was conclusive or like enough to put them away. Like it wasn't enough evidence to say like, yes, you did this. None of it proved that Hughes or Mullen were at the Lincoln Monument <clears throat> at the time of the break-in. The fact is Tyrell had botched the showdown at the monument. The whole case against the grave robbers rested on the testimony of Lewis Sweggles, a known thief. Hughes and Mullen were confident they'd soon be free, and they probably would have been if only they could have sat tight. But they were nervous about one thing, their lack of an alibi. If only someone would swear to having seen them far from Springfield while the monument break-in was occurring. The Coney men worked out a plan. Mullen asked the prison guard for paper and a pencil. His first letter was to fellow Coney man Thomas Sharp, the man who'd blown the first attempt to steal Lincoln's body earlier that year. Mullen asked Sharp to get a message to a mutual friend, Nathan Lightning Rod Curtis. Curtis was to tell police he'd seen Mullen and Hughes in Springfield on election day and invited them to stay over at his farm near town. Mullen wrote out the exact statement he wanted Curtis to make, the spelling in the Coney man's own, is the Coney man's own. Mullen and Hughes come to my house about eight o'clock. This is the first time I ever seen Hughes. Mullen said they missed the train. We played cards a while and they wanted to go, and I told them to stay all night. They stayed all night and had breakfast next morning. Left about half past six o'clock in the morning. Now, there were a lot of uh, typing or written errors in there, uh, spelling, and he said, they, or he said, Mullen said instead of said. So there's no doubt that he wrote that. Sharp got the letter, but he was sick of trouble with the law and decided not to deliver it to Curtis. Instead, he brought it to the Springfield jail and handed it to a guard. The guard gave it to the sheriff who gave it to Charles Reed, the lawyer leading the prosecution of Hughes and Mullen. When Mullen didn't hear back from Sharp, he wrote a second letter, this time to a fellow Coney man named William Birdsall. Mullen asked Birdsall to tell police he'd seen Hughes and Mullen walking away from Springfield early in the evening on election day. He should say he gave the men a ride and they stayed over at his house. I think you can do it if only you use your head, Mullen urged his friend. We will secure the money for you. I think we can raise you $35 cash. This letter never reached the post office. The jailer gave it directly to the prosecutor. While in town, Tyrell talked with the Springfield Police Chief, Abner Wilkinson. Wilkinson told Tyrell about the rumors that had surfaced right before July 4th, how members of the Logan County gang were supposedly in town to steal Lincoln's body. Tyrell contacted one of the gang, Vine Williams, and paid him 10 bucks to answer a few questions. 
Williams confirmed that some of the Logan County boys, not him, of course, had planned to steal the casket and that it had all been set up by Big Jim Kennelly. Tyrell reported to his boss, this establishes the fact beyond a doubt that the counterfeiters were active for some way to liberate Ben Boyd. And sir, the moving spirit was this same Jim Kennelly, formerly of St. Louis. It all fit. The Secret Service had no evidence against Big Jim. So he was safe for now. But at least Tyrell knew the truth. Satisfied with his week's work in Springfield, he headed home to Chicago. Back in his office, Tyrell sat down to write a special report for Chief Brooks. He wanted an exact accounting of every penny spent on the Lincoln case. Tyrell's report was long and detailed, listing each expense and its cost, including payments to Swaggles and Billy Brown, train tickets, hotel rooms, pack rides, meals, telegraphs, even the $2 Tyrell spent on new shoes for Jack Hughes. In total, Tyrell reported busting up the plot to steal Lincoln's body had cost the U.S. government $393.32. All right, and we, be on, we will be on chapter 17 tomorrow, and it is called Compromise Verdict. All right, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.